Welcome to the BP Mindcast. I'm Jonathan Bartlett, your host. These podcasts cover a wide variety of topics from a conservative academic viewpoint. Some you'll find interesting, some you won't. However, I plan on keeping these things short enough that you can easily enjoy what you like, and hopefully I won't keep you too long for those that you don't. Today I wanted to um, revisit and follow up on some of the things I was talking about in the last podcast about intelligent design. So um, what most people don't understand about intelligent design is, is they want their theory of origins to cover everything. So they want, um, they want it to answer all their questions. And the thing about intelligent design, what makes it good, what makes it a good science is that it doesn't try to answer all the questions. It tries to pick out specific answerable questions um, and find justifiable answers to those questions. So the theory of intelligent design doesn't have all of the answers for everything that you might want to ask about origins. Um, it only is able to, to answer certain types of questions. And so, um, for example, uh, one thing that a lot of people dealing with origins want to ask about is did everything come from a common ancestor or not? Um, did, did, you know, when, and when people talk about evolution, they can talk about a variety of things, but one of the things that people mean by evolution is did everybody share a common ancestor? Did we all climb out of the ooze uh, many eons ago? And so uh, unfortunately that question actually isn't answered by intelligent design. Um, intelligent design is actually compatible with both the view that everything shares a common ancestor in a, in a, a small microorganism that existed billions and billions of years ago and it's also compatible with the idea that um, different groups were created um, at some point in, um, in natural history. So it's actually consistent with both of those. What intelligent design is not consistent with is the, is the idea that the way that organisms developed is entirely by accidental processes. The idea that, um, that we were able to go from uh, basically slime, ooze, whatever, uh, to humans through a process that had no preordained direction. Um, and so to, to give you an idea of, of, of where the thinking is on that, I want you to imagine that you're installing the operating system for your computer. Now the operating system for your computer has lots and lots of programs. You can think about the control panel, that's a program. Um, it probably has some sort of little file editor on it, like WordPad or Notepad. It might have a, um, it might have a, a clock program, so you can set your clock. It has a program to look through your files. It has a program to manage your desktop. There's all these different little programs that are on your operating system. But when you install your program, when you install your operating system, it actually all starts on one disk and you have an installer disk. And so you put in that one disk, which is one program, and it creates all these other programs. So um, anyway, so, so what is happening is that in essence, your computer, all of the programs on your computer had a common ancestor, which is the installer. Um, now it is not true that those programs arose by uh, happenstance processes. They arose because there was information on the installer that allowed them to arise. Um, and so that's, that's the thing about intelligent design. Intelligent design doesn't actually give you the details of natural history. It can tell you which things are require design at some point in their natural history. It can't tell you when that happened. It can't tell you um, if it uh, was packaged in another, uh, information bearing process. It can just tell you that, yes, this sort of thing required information uh, to arise. And so um, I think a lot of critics of intelligent design miss this point. Um, and then um, the, so um, there's, a, there's actually a theorem in intelligent design called the displacement theorem. And uh, this basically shows that uh, you can, in fact, push design back in time. So we can say, okay, well, th maybe this wasn't designed here. Um, it, this, uh, this organism inherited these designs from beforehand. Um, you can push design back 
Um, and you can actually say that um, maybe there was a process that built these new organs or whatever. Maybe there's a process that put together new organs from other organs. Those are all possibilities. Um, but what the displacement theorem says is that if you decide to, to say that th there were processes that built these processes, well, those sorts of processes actually require more information than the processes they built. So you actually make the design problem harder, not easier, by um, supposing that there's some sort of a meta system that's building systems. So you actually make the design bigger, not smaller. And so um, this, is, this is what makes intelligent design so powerful is that um, you know, it doesn't have to specify whether uh, something was created yesterday, a uh, hundred years ago, a million years ago, a billion years ago, a trillion years ago, it doesn't matter. Um, what matters is that if it shows evidence of design, then uh, whether then then that evidence is true irrespective of how long of a process it take took for that thing to come into being. And so um, anyway, so that's that's kind of the idea behind intelligent design and how it relates to evolution. Now, for myself, um, I do not believe that everything on Earth shares a common ancestor. Um, but nonetheless, I think that uh, we need to be careful when we're thinking and when we're talking about what sort of things are demonstrated, what sort of things we believe, and what sort of things we have some evidence for. And so I think intelligent de design does a good job of demonstrating that certain parts of biology require design. Um, we make a mistake when we take that as a demonstration of something else, like a so just because something was demonstrated to require design doesn't mean that it was demonstrated to have been created directly. That doesn't show that it's been demonstrated that it didn't have ancestors. Um, there's all, so we just need to be careful um, to link our, um, link our evidences to what they are actually evidences of. So anyway, there are other things that show um, that you can use to talk about uh, ancestry, that you can use to, to talk about whether or not ancestry is the, uh, the best way of describing the re relationship between organisms. Um, and some of that actually is uh, at least tangentially uh, related to intelligent design, but the, the mere fact of design detection uh, does not give that to you. So anyway, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about um, the relationship between intelligent design, evolution, and creation. So just to be more specific, you know, creationism specifically deals with multiple creation instances. So that, um, that God created different things, uh, different, um, either at the spe different species or maybe different families, um, that there are more than one specific thing that God created. Um, and therefore, Intelligent design is not the same thing as creationism because intelligent design doesn't dictate how many, uh, uh, doesn't dictate whether the design originated from a single organism a long time ago that just had the information or if they were separate information deposits. Um, design detection just doesn't do that. So anyway. Um, intelligent design simply tries to show what is capable of showing. It is a specific tool uh, to answer a specific question, and that's actually what makes it better as a um, as a general science tool. Than, um, and just recognize that the fact that it doesn't answer all of your questions probably means that it answers the questions that the specific question that it's trying to answer. Um, it, it answers that question well. So um, I hope you enjoyed your time on BP Mindcast. Until next time, keep thinking.